morning. Today's reading, if you want to follow along, it is on the front of your bulletin. That's what I'm going to read from, but it's coming from the scriptures. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. Brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you are spiritual. Restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work, and then he will reason for boasting in regard to himself alone, and not in regard to another. For each one will bear his own load. The one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are the household of the faith. Good morning, everybody. Go ahead and take your Bibles and open up there to Galatians chapter 6 this morning. That's going to be our text both for this morning and this evening as we start a two-part lesson in our series of lessons around God's great expectations. What does God expect of us and how do we fulfill what God expects of us? Before we begin, I want to thank Wesley for that good prayer, uh, Ben for the good songs, and Corey for the good uh, scripture reading this morning. It's such a blessing to have such talented men here, is it not? Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 10 will be our text. A few things I want to mention before we dive into this passage of scripture. All of you who have young children from uh, the smallest age all the way up through teenagers, I want all of you to remember that tonight starts our kids sing. So tonight... Be here at regular time, 6 o'clock. We'll have our kids sing to start off services, and uh, we'll give you some more information about that and what it's going to entail, and I'll have some handouts for you to study at home while you're by yourself, but uh, with your children. I want you to remember that that starts tonight at 6 o'clock, so I'd love for you to come back and join us for that. Also, we're recording all of the lessons, and they're being placed on YouTube. We have a few of them up now, and if you ever want to go back and watch the lessons, you can do that. You can just search Bowden Church of Christ on YouTube. And you can review those later if uh, you miss a service or if you want to rehear a lesson, uh, you can go back and listen to those. Then you can also get a recording from Jerome as we audio record all the lessons. As we continue to think about God's great expectations and what God expects of you and me, what expectations He has of our life, I want to ask you a really simple question this morning. Are you a responsible person? Are you a responsible person? In Romans chapter 2 and verse 6, Paul writing about the judgment of God says concerning how God's going to judge us, Romans chapter 2 and verse 6, that He's going to render to each one according to His deeds. The Bible teaches us very clearly throughout Scripture that God not only expects, but He commands us to be responsible. Now, God wants you and I to be responsible today because there's going to come a day when we're all going to have to be responsible for our actions, regardless if we want to or not. So the question we're going to ponder this morning and this evening, I've got two points for you this morning and three for this evening. If you want to follow along, there's an outline in your bulletin on the opening page. The question I want us to ponder this morning is, are you a responsible person? I ran across a few quotes as we think about how God greatly expects us to be responsible. One quote being this. If you think about the flood, no individual raindrop ever considered itself responsible for the flood. Not a single individual raindrop considered itself responsible. Abraham Lincoln was the one who said that you cannot escape the responsibility of today by evading it tomorrow. As we think about responsibility this morning, I want you to understand that God wants us to be responsible. God expects us to be responsible. But the thing about being responsible is that responsibility is contagious. That is, you're going to catch it from the people that are around you. Let me give you a few illustrations of that. If you're in a family 
And it is common in your family that people are responsible. That is, when they wake up in the morning, they make their bed. When trash day comes around, they roll the trash down to the room. When it's time to do the dishes, the dishes get done. When it's time to mow the grass, the grass gets mowed. If you live in a family where they take their responsibilities serious, then that's going to be contagious. If everybody else does that, you're going to catch on and follow their lead. Responsibility is contagious. However, the other side of that is also true. If most of the people in your family are not responsible, they don't take their responsibilities serious, they don't do what they're supposed to, and they don't do things on time, guess what? You're probably going to catch that irresponsibility. It's, a, it's an attitude, a mindset that is contagious. Let's move that a little bit further. Think about a congregation. If there's a congregation of people who are striving to follow God and most of them are responsible with their soul, they're responsible in worship, they're present, they worship God in spirit and in truth, they are responsible with the people outside of the congregation that they're trying to teach the truth. If that's the common practice, guess what? Most people are going to pick up on that. It's going to be contagious. However, if the opposite is true, if the congregation is irresponsible with their soul, irresponsible with their words, and irresponsible with their actions, more than likely people are going to catch on. We know this in every aspect of our life. Our workplaces, our homes, our schools. Responsibility is a powerful, positive influence. But irresponsibility is a powerful, negative influence. And both are contagious. Let's look at a few definitions as we begin this morning to think about responsibility and what the word responsibility means. We're going to tie all these back to Scripture and then we're going to dive into our text. The first one that I found concerning responsibility is that to be responsible means that, number one, I am answerable or accountable. That is, I am able and willing and capable of giving an answer or being accountable for my own actions. And doesn't the Bible teach us that? There in Romans chapter 2 and verse 6, one day we're going to have to give an answer for our actions. Whether we want to or not or whether we like that idea or not, we have to give an answer for our actions. And so to be responsible means that I'm accountable or I'm answerable. I have that capability. Number two is the idea of having power to control myself or my behavior. To be responsible means I have the ability to control my actions, my words, my thoughts. I have the ability to have control over myself. And the Bible clearly teaches us this in Galatians 5 when it talks about the fruits of the Spirit. One of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control, that I can control myself. Not only that, but the idea of responsibility also correlates with having the capacity for moral decisions. And the Bible teaches me that God wants me to be responsible for my decisions. Finally, this is just kind of an off-the-wall definition of it, but one that I found. Responsibility also correlates in being responsible towards government. And we know that Romans 13 teaches us that God has placed the officials in, in place in our society and in our culture. And that we have to be responsible not only to our government, but the laws that they make. That's the idea of being responsible. Here's the thing I want you to understand before we dive into verse 1 of Galatians 6. As a Christian, you should be the most responsible person in your family, in your workplace, in your schools, in your congregations, in your clubs, in your teams. You should be, as a Christian, the most responsible person, not because you want to be, but because our faith demands it of us. God commands that we be responsible. And so as we study this morning, I want you to put away all doubt. I don't want you, as we study, as we look at these points, say, huh, you know, I know who that could apply to. No, we need to look in the mirror and think about ourselves. Are you a responsible person? Do the people that know you best, the people that are around you on a regular basis, do they think, you know what, I can rely on that guy. I can trust that, that, that woman. She is responsible. I trust her. At work, for instance, if you raise your hand and say, you know what, here's a project, I'll take care of that, that, that that'll be my responsibility, I'll, I'll take that under, people, do they go, whew, man, I am glad that they took that on, I, I know that they're going to follow up on their word, or do they go, oh no, we're going to have to follow them around and make sure they do everything right. Are you a responsible person? Whether you're a, fa a father, a mother, a wife, a child, an employee, a cousin, an aunt, an uncle, whatever your role is, a boss... Are you a responsible person? Do you naturally take care of your responsibilities or do others have to take care of them for you? I'm going to propose to you out of Galatians 6, 1 through 10 over the next two lessons 
that God demands that we be the people that hold up to our responsibilities. And that he's laid on us responsibilities that we need to live up to. The reason I think this is so important is because you never hear anybody say this. <laughs> you know, I just love being around that person. They are so irresponsible. It just warms my heart to spend time with them. You know why that's not true? Because if you have someone in your life that's irresponsible, you experience pain. You have problems. You have to pick up for the slack that they leave behind. It's a problem to be irresponsible. But number number. Uh, the most important, number one, is, is that it's a spiritual problem. We need to be responsible people. Let's open up the text and study from Galatians 6, 1 through 10. We got two points this morning, three tonight. We're going to talk about being responsible in the church, being responsible with our souls, and being responsible with our actions. And so I hope these will help you as we grow together studying this text of Galatians 6, 1 through 10. Let's begin with Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 2. As we look at our first point this morning, God expects us to be a sharing people. God expects us to be a sharing people. Let's begin in verse 1 of Galatians 6. Paul says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Then in verse 2 he goes on to say, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Folks, isn't it a great blessing this morning that I know there are some burdens that are going to sit on my shoulders that I don't have to bear alone? There are some burdens that I can share with you, and there are some burdens that you can share with me. Now, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1 doesn't read this way. Brethren, if any man is overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. No, he doesn't use the word should. He says, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. You see, this is not a suggestion that Paul makes in Galatians 6 and verse 1. This is a command. This is an expectation that he lays down on the people that we read about in Galatians 6. A few words I want us to look at as we go through point number one. The first one is this. As we look at this text, let's consider the first word in verse 1. That is the word brethren. Now, for you and I, it's very important to note that Paul calls these people brethren. Because later, if you just look back in your Bible to chapter 5, and you go down to verse 4, it says, You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by the law. You have fallen from Christ. Grace, For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of the righteousness of, by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. Galatians chapter 5, verses 4 through 6, clearly tells us that the people Paul is writing to, they had some problems. It says there in verse 4 specifically, they had become estranged from Christ. They had fallen from grace. Yet I find it very interesting that in chapter 6 and verse 1, he then goes on to say, brethren. You know, the, the truth is that the people that he's writing to in Galatians, they had fallen off a step. They had made a few mistakes. They had done some things wrong. They had gone off course, if you will, for a moment. But yet Paul was not ready to give up on them. And that teaches us a very interesting lesson about our responsibility. Sometimes we as Christians are too easy to write other people off. We're too easy to give up on them, to lay down arms and say, you know what, there's nothing more I can do for this person. Paul teaches us there's always more we can do because he calls them brethren. Let's look at another word very quickly. Before we go to that, though, I want to share this with you. I find it very encouraging in this text that when I make a mistake as a, as a Christian, that if I spiritually stumble and I fall down, I find great encouragement in the fact that you as Christians this morning that are sitting in front of me, that you have been commanded to come and help me gather the strength to stand up again. I find that very encouraging. But not only do I find that very encouraging there, we get down to the last phrase of chapter 2, and he says, by having this mindset, by, by being, being willing to share burdens, notice what he says at the end. You so fulfill the law of Christ. I don't know about you. Have you, ever, have you ever thought, you know, I wish that I could just go up to God and say, God, how am I doing? Just, just kind of give me a field report. Am I doing okay? Are there things I need to change? A am I handling situations rightly? How do I know that I'm doing what you want me to do? That's not a new question for anybody to ask. And I think that you've probably asked it yourself before. 
I need to know that I'm doing right. I, I wish I could just ask the Lord, am I fulfilling your will? Folks, I can know beyond any shadow of a doubt that this is a question people have asked before. Because if you turn your Bibles for just a moment back to Matthew 22. Matthew chapter 22. And we're going to begin in verse 34. And I want you to notice a question that was asked of Jesus that's very similar to what question we have asked before. You know, I, sometimes I ask, Lord, as a preacher, what do you want me to focus on more than anything else? What do you want me to do more than anything else? And, and you may, Lord, as a Christian, Lord, as an elder, Lord, as a deacon, what do you want me to focus on? Where do you want me to put my efforts? Notice, verse 34, the Pharisees heard he had silenced the Sadducees. They gathered together, then one of them, a lawyer, asking him a question, testing him, saying, Lord, which is the greatest commandment in the law? You see, the Pharisee was coming to test Jesus, but even he had a very basic question. Lord, what's the most important thing? What's the most, what is the greatest commandment in the law? I don't know if you've ever asked that question for yourself before, but I have. Lord, how am I doing? I can guarantee you we know that we're pleasing to the Lord if we follow Galatians 6, 1 and 2. That I am willing to share the burdens of others. Because he says at the end of verse 2, by doing this, I fulfill the law of Christ. That's a great and high compliment. That if I help other people in their burdens, I am fulfilling Christ's law. I should take heart and comfort in that. Let's look at a few other words here because these are very interesting uh, phrases that he's using here. He says, Brother, if any man is caught, if a man is caught or overtaken in any trespass, trespass. This idea is simply a sin. But we need to understand what type of sin he's talking about. Paul's not talking about someone who's given their life over to sin in Galatians 6 and verse 1. He's not talking about someone who has immersed themselves in sin. He's talking about someone who has fallen off the path for a moment. This word, uh, trespass, is simply a stepping off. For a moment. It is someone who has for a moment stepped away. It's an isolated action. And this word literally means a falling to the side. That is, someone has been walking down the right path and they have fallen to the side. And the immediate reaction of the church should be, hey, hey, let's come help you and pick you up. That should be my immediate reaction. I want you to picture it this way. Imagine a small child has gotten their hand on a paper cut and they're walking through the house. And suddenly that child takes that paper clip and they're reaching towards a power socket. What would we all do when we saw, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. And we would run over and grab them to try and keep them from messing up. What if they got that paper clip in that socket? We would grab them very quickly and pull them back, would we not? You see, this is the responsibility of the church. This is not someone who has grabbed hold, and, and I'm sure some of our, our, our members who work in the power uh, field, they could tell us how dangerous it would be to be near the power lines that are down during a storm. This is not someone who is holding tight to a power line and just constantly living in sin. This is someone who has made a minor, isolated mistake. And so we, as the church, our responsibility is to run after them, grab them, and pull them back. It's a burden that they hold, and it's the responsibility of the church to jump to the aid. You see, that's part of me sharing a burden. I run to them quickly to try and keep them from doing even more damage. I want you to think about someone who would be walking through the parking lot. And if they were carrying a heavy weight, say they were moving a piece of furniture, or they were carrying something heavy, and that was weighing heavy on them, and we saw their legs begin to bow and, and their knees begin to shake, we would immediately run to them and try and help them bear that load. Imagine an elderly woman who may be in an elderly woman who may be in a parking lot carrying groceries and she's struggling and she doesn't have a buggy. Any of us, it doesn't matter who we are, we would run to that woman and say, Ma'am, can I help you? Can I help take some of this load, some of this burden from you? You see, this should be the attitude of the church. I am, I am supposed to be sharing in the burdens of others. But I don't want to play this down lightly for a moment because we need to understand this word restore. I don't want to downplay the situation that we're talking about in Galatians 6 and verses 1 and 2. No sin is minor. No sin is minor. Every time we sin, we learn from Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, if we choose to willfully live in sin and we don't repent of it, that separates us from God. And so Paul uses this very strong word in Galatians 6 and verse 1. 
Brethren, if a man is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore. Now, if we think of the word restore or restoration, we think of anything that is in non-working order, anything that is broken, anything that is not the way it should be, taking it from that state and making it something that is working, that is no longer broken, that is in working order. And so Paul says when someone steps off the path for a moment, that is a sign of brokenness. And we need to make sure that we strive to help restore, restore them. The idea of restoring is oftentimes tied in Scripture to the mending of fishing nets. That is, while I'm on the job, a net has broken. And so I stop everything that I do. I give attention to that net to fix it and put it back in working order to where it can be used again. It is to take something that is broken and to fix it. Now, if you... Turn your attention over to Ephesians chapter 4 for just a moment. Just just maybe a couple pages over from Galatians in your Bible. Ephesians chapter 4, it teaches us the seriousness of sin. You see, we need to be very careful about restoring someone because when someone gets lost in the muck and the mire of sin, it begins to throw them and toss them in ways of life that they never intended on living. Notice how Paul uses this language in, in Ephesians 4, the language of the sea. He says in verse 14 of Ephesians 4 that we should no longer be children. Children who are tossed to and fro and are carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. The idea of restoring someone is fixing the nets while they're on the sea. It is to stop and give attention to what is broken. The reason that we stop and give attention to what is broken is because there are damaging effects of the sin that lets itself stay for a little while. We should never as Christians offer to sin, hey, why don't you pull up a chair and eat with us for a little bit? We should never as Christians offer sin, hey, why don't you stay the night with me? When sin presents itself at the door, we go to the person who is being tempted by it, like the child by the light socket, and we rip them away as fast as we can. You see, that's the responsibility of the Christian. God expects you and I to be responsible. And this, here in Galatians 6, verses 1 and 2, is how we should deal with things that we cannot bear on our own. God commands us to have enough responsibility, enough of the right mindset to be able to help the burdens of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And folks, this is, when you really get down to the base of it, an amazing countercultural idea. Because what does the world say? The world says every man for himself. I'm going to manipulate and deceive until I get what's best for me. Every man for himself. But God says myself for every man. That's my job as a Christian. To give myself to bear the loads of my brothers and sisters in Christ. I bear your sin. And the idea is here in Galatians 6, 1 and 2. If any man is caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. The idea is that I do it for you so that one day when I fall, I can trust you're going to do it for me as well. Why? Because that's the nature of the community of the church. That's our job. Now, let me clarify before we move into our, our, our second point this morning, which is our last one. This doesn't happen by happenstance. You're not just going to automatically, without any preparation or any of the correct mindset, you're not just going to automatically do what God wants you to do in regard to bearing others' burdens. Why? Because the world has a good influence pulling us away, saying every man for himself. And so in order for you and I to do this, we have to have the right mindset. We have to have our minds set on the right things. If we want to be like Christ, we have to show and feel the compassion that Christ felt. In Luke chapter 10, the parable of the Good Samaritan is shared. And Jesus asked this question after all these people had come and talked to him and, and people had walked past this man and then the Good Samaritan comes by and picks him up, takes him to the end, pays for all his, all his injuries. Jesus says, so which one of these men was neighbor to him who fell among thieves? And, of course, the answer was 
He who showed mercy on him. And then Jesus gives us that command, go and do likewise. You see, our responsibility is to show compassion on people. Jesus has shown us the ultimate example of that compassion. And so we need to reciprocate that merciful mindset. I need to have mercy on people. Interestingly enough, in Micah chapter 6, when Micah is discussing the destruction of Israel, how they had left God and they weren't serving Him anymore, he said, you know, what should I come before the Lord with? Uh, calves a year old, the, uh, my firstborn. Should I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? No, God has told you what to do, O oh man, what is good. And he says we need to love mercy. That's Micah 6 and verse 8. Folks, we as Christians need to love to show mercy. That should be something that I love to administer because I have love for others. And Jesus gave us that example, Matthew chapter 9, verses 36 and 37. He saw the multitudes and he was moved with compassion for them because they were, like, they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Sheep having no shepherd. Our first responsibility this morning in the church is that you and I be willing to share the burdens of others. That is, I am willing to help others when they're burdened and they're down. Point number two in our last one this morning. Point number two is that I need to avoid selfishness. I need to avoid selfishness. If I'm going to be able to accomplish what Paul says in Galatians 6, 1 and 2 about bearing burdens for others, I need to avoid being a selfish person. Arrogance has always stood in the way of being a responsible Christian. Let's go ahead and lay that out to begin with. Arrogance has always stood in the way of us being responsible Christians. The arrogant and the selfish attitude of some Christians today tears apart the fabric of the community of the church. It rips apart the heart of which God has asked us to have. And when I have a disdain for the problems of others, I am not fulfilling the law of Christ. I am going against the law of God. So I need to have that as my mindset moving in. Because Paul says in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 3, he says, If anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. If anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing... He deceives himself. I cannot accomplish the bearing of other people's burdens when I am a selfish person. Because I don't care about you if I'm selfish. You don't mean anything to me. I may act like you do on the outside and occasionally maybe on Sunday morning I may give the face like you mean something to me. But in reality, I'm never going to sacrifice for you. I'm never going to do anything for you. When I am selfish, I deceive myself and I think I'm something when I'm really nothing. 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 3 in that great prayer we read about in, in chapter 2. Notice what it said. Talk no more so very proudly. And let no arrogance, arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is the God of knowledge. And notice, by Him actions are weighed. Part of being responsible demands that you and I be humble. <clears throat> I be humble. Humility says this. Humility says, I'm no better than you. And so if there is a part of your burden that I can bear, I'll absolutely do that for you. I will help you to be better, not beat you for being bad. Now, I, I may get on a hobby horse here, so just bear with me for a moment. Okay. If I'm going to truly be a responsible person, I am going to be humble enough to say I am no better than you. That is, when I approach somebody and I see them like the child about to stick the paper clip in the wall socket, I don't laugh at them for being so dumb as to stick a paper clip in a wall socket. I don't laugh at them for not realizing that that's going to hurt them. I don't make fun of them because they have done something that has hurt them in the long run. I don't look at them and say, that person's not really worth my time. I'm not going to help them. No, when I am humble enough, when I understand that I really am nothing, and this isn't to hurt your self-esteem. I, 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 don't, I don't intend that. What God's trying to teach us here in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 3 is that compared to His eternal purpose, our desires and selfish wants mean nothing. They're meaningless. So in order for me to be a responsible and a humble person, I need to extend forgiveness and grace to someone without the intention of beating them down for not being spiritually mature. And that is a sign of being spiritually mature. 
When we talk about someone who's caught in sin, the idea is not to be vindictive towards them, vindictive towards them for messing up. Church discipline is always redemptive, not vindictive. The idea is always to bring them back. Not to make fun of them for being down. And so if I'm going to be a responsible Christian, I need to have this mindset. When we're in the boat and the net breaks and we have to mend the net, we don't yell at the net for being broken. We fix it. We don't shoot the wounded while they're down. So we can be tempted, as Paul brings out here in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 3, we can be tempted to think of ourselves highly because we are the spiritual ones who are to restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. Let us never be confused. It is not by my opinion that actions are weighed. It is not by my opinion that, our act, that actions are weighed. In fact, we learn in 1 Samuel 2 and verse 3 that it's by God that actions are weighed. Now, if I want to know how to weigh actions, this is where I go. If I want to know what's right and wrong, I go to the, to the word that the Spirit inspired, the word of truth. That for 2 Peter 3 and verse 1 and verse 3 says, God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, For the scriptures are given by inspiration of God. They're profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped unto every good work. If I want to know what's right and wrong, this is where I go. And I've said this time and time again, and I will say it as long as I'm here, and you'll hear it till your ears fall off. If I say something from this pulpit, and you don't find it in here, if you don't come to me, you're not being responsible with your, your, your responsibility to help bear burdens. That is, if you see me teaching something that's not in the Word, that's a sin. And if I'm approaching the light socket with the paper clip, hey, you better come grab me very quickly. Because this is what's right. This is the truth. 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 3 says that by God actions are weighed. But oftentimes it's the legalistic Christians who tend to be the most condemning of others and prideful in their self-righteousness. For just a moment, and then we're going to conclude our thoughts, open up to Luke 18. We never want to be like the two men or like one of the two men that's described in Luke 18. Because when we look at Luke 18, we see a picture of two men. We begin in verse 9 and it says that Jesus spoke the parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. There were a group of people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous themselves. This could describe some of our society today. Verse 10, two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, notice, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much raise his eyes up to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. My job, as Brother John Rice over in Clay County says, is not to get people told. It's to save their soul. So when I deal with people, I need to deal with them in a humble way. When I strive to bear the burdens of others, I need to bear their burdens. This humility that we read about is tied also to guarding ourselves. Because we look in the immediate context, he says in verse 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. But when you're bearing them, in verse 1 he says, you need to watch yourself, lest you also be tempted. You know, I need to be humble enough to know that when I go to try and help somebody in sin, that sin has this sucking mechanism to it. That it begins to suck in everybody that's around it to do what's wrong. And I need to be careful when I do that. When I spend time with the word, you and I, with the world, you and I need to be careful because they can suck us in just as quick as anything else can. We need to be careful. This idea of being tempted that we read about in Galatians 6, 1, 2, and 3, that the person is tempted, they're drawn away in a trespass. The idea is, in the view of the word, is to, to take someone and destroy them. Folks, that's, that's Satan's ideal situation. He wants to take you and then destroy you. That's his goal. And so we need to be very careful. We need to be humble enough to guard ourselves when we're around sinful actions. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8 says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Self-deception is a very dangerous thing. So we all need to evaluate and judge ourselves so that we can avoid overestimating ourselves and we can avoid seeming high like we are very important and more spiritual and we're the one to help everybody and so we put ourselves up on a pedestal, put the crown on our head and say, How wonderful am I? 
We need to be careful about that. Our goal is to reach out and to help others. That's part of my responsibility as a Christian. So the question I ask you this morning, are you a responsible person? Are you responsible? Have you been responsible with your church family? Have you been responsible with the burdens that the people you see around you are bearing? They're, 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 they're like the woman who's carrying the load of groceries and she can't and she almost can't even make it to her car because she's so weighed down by the trials of life. And sometimes we just watch and say, I wish somebody would go help that woman. Am I responsible enough to take the initiative? Am I responsible enough to help share the burdens of others? And in doing that, am I responsible enough to leave selfish thoughts at the door? These are the two foundational points that will lead us into our discussion tonight. I'm going to ask you tonight, have you been responsible with your salvation? I'm also going to ask you, have you been responsible with your actions? We learn very, very quickly in Galatians 6, verses 1 through 10, that a lot of what I experience in this life is tied to my sowing. And now I'm reaping what I've done. Have I been responsible in my actions? God... Romans chapter 2 and verse 6 is going to all hold us accountable one day. We're going to have to be responsible for what we've said, done, thought. At one point, the question is, are you being responsible now so that you're prepared for them? God wants us to be responsible. And this morning, God wants you to be responsible with your soul. God wants you to consider where you will spend eternity. Will you spend eternity with God? If you, if you left, and I know this is, this is not a technique to get you emotional. That's not what I'm trying to do. What I want you to do is think. If you left here this morning, and you got in the car, and you drove out of that parking lot, and, and something took place where your life ended, and suddenly you stood before the Lord at judgment, would He say, you were responsible? You took care of your soul. You knew what you needed to do, and you did it come into heaven? Or would you be as someone who is irresponsible, who didn't care for their soul? God wants you to be a part of the church today. God wants you to be added to the church when you obey the gospel plan of salvation. And we read about it in Acts chapter 2 that after Peter preached that sermon about how they killed Jesus, they said, what are we supposed to do, man, brother? What shall we do? He said, I want you to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, the problem was that they had killed Jesus. They had sin they needed to get rid of. And there was only way, one way to get rid of it, and that was through the blood of Jesus. And we contact that blood of Jesus, Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, when we're baptized into the watery grave of baptism, just like Jesus was put in the grave and he rose up out of it, we'll arise out of that water in newness of life. Maybe you need to study more about how to become a Christian. Maybe you've got sin you need to deal with. Make sure you're responsible this morning. Whatever your need is, please come as we stand and sing.